today be about uh, your business. We pray, Lord, for your glory to be seen here, your rest to be experienced here, and for us to come away with a better understanding of what it is that the faith of our fathers means. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you might have guessed, we're, we're talking about faith this morning. We're going to ask the question, what is faith? And can I do anything to gain favor with God? Because if, if I can do anything, I need to do something. If I can't do anything, I need to understand why and how it, all of that works. And if faith, listen to me very carefully, if faith is the key to our salvation, and the Bible says that it is, if faith is the key to our salvation, we ought to understand what it is, right? And we ought to understand what it's not. There's a whole lot of misunderstanding about this faith idea. And we need to understand what does the Bible say about it? What does it say faith is and what does it mean? Is it just a sort of an ephemeral hope? Is that what it is? I just hope it's true. Is that what faith is? It's like uh, I speak into a class of uh, little kids. When my daughter was in, was in elementary school, they invited me to come speak to a class about the, uh, the other side of what the argument for evolution is. So if creation or evolution. And one of the kids asked me, and one of the neat things about speaking to, to schools is if a child asks you a question, you can answer it. So I love that. And children love to ask questions. So this little girl, she says, so uh, you, you use the word faith. What does that mean? Does that mean that you believe in something that doesn't make any sense? I thought, what a great question. That's an awesome question. That's what most people think it is. Even people sitting in churches here this morning, all across America, believe that faith is just having an understanding and accepting something that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's the farthest thing from what biblical faith is, and we want to touch on that today and talk about what faith is and what it's not. So let's review where we've been so far in the book of Romans. In Romans 1 through 11, we said we were going to be talking about doctrine. That's what Christians believe. And we have started off talking about the fact that it says God created all of this. And to give evidence is for, and I gave you a whole Sunday of evidences for just the creation. And then the next Sunday, I came back and I said, I want to tell you that all of that intricate detail, all of the fine-tuning of the universe, all the stuff we talked about is followed by the miracles going on in a single cell. All, thousands, hundreds of thousands of little engines in there and, and machines in that cell that make it work. And then there's millions, literally millions of cells in, in something like the eye, the human eye, that have to function just perfectly. And then some parts of the eye have a cell that develop in a particular way to make the retina work, and other parts, the optic uh, nerve work. And all these cells working in together have to work perfectly together to make it work. And the Bible says in the first part of Romans that, that the evidences of God are clearly seen in the things that are unseen. We can't see these things, but now we can, we've got these mag, um, microscopes that, that can look down into the cell that we once thought was the smallest element and we see these gazillions of machines in there working, the miracles of all of that. And I gave you some statistic odds of those things actually happening. It's incredible. So the creation of God we've talked about, the creation by God. Uh, last week we looked at both the doctrine of man and the doctrine of the atonement, the depravity of man, that man is depraved, we're deprived we, when we fell, uh, when humanity fell, that sin came into the world, and we are sinners by, by nature, and we're sinners by choice. So both of those things are true. So the doctrine of man is that we are, we are not created perfect. We're not created uh, with a, a good nature. We have a bent towards sin. So all of those things are true. But then there's the doctrine of the atonement, which answers the doctrine of man. The doctrine of the atonement says... But, and anytime you see the word but in the Bible, that's a really good word because it's telling us all about our own sinfulness. It says, but God, there's two word, nice words back to back, but God made available to us the doctrine of the atonement that says, I want to resolve that conflict between you and God. 
I'm going to tear down that problem that keeps you from having a relationship with God. And we look at the fact that when Christ was crucified on the cross, that the earth shook, the skies turned dark, and the veil was rent to the Holy of Holies from top to bottom, it says. The idea of the, the words that are used there, the Greek words that are used there, is it was completely separated, top from bottom, this four to six inch thick curtain that kept man separated from the very presence of God. And it says, now you have access to me. That's what the atonement did. It gave us access. Today we look at the doctrine of the justification by faith. Justification by faith. Now the word justification just means that we are justified before the Father. Here's an easy way to remember that. Watch this. If you're justified before God the Father, it is justified just as if I'd never sinned. That's what justification is. So if, it's, if our justification is by faith, we ought to want to know what does that mean? What does that word faith mean? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, doctrine of justification by faith, two things I want to remember what the word justification means. It means it's that before God it's just as if I'd never sinned. And the Latin word sola fide. Sola fide just means uh, in faith alone. In other words, it's not your faith plus anything else. That's not, that's, you're not adding anything to faith. It's not faith plus some works that you do. It's not faith plus some uh, tradition or some ritual that you do. None of that has any favor with God. None of it has any merit with God. He says your sola fide means that it's faith alone. It is by faith alone that you are saved and you have a relationship with God. So we need to know what faith means. What does it what does it entail? How do I receive it? What's it all about? There is a, a passage in Ephesians that we need to go to for this and it is our go-to message here. I want to point out to you that uh, here we go. This word believed right here it is the same exact Greek word as faith. So when you see the word believe or trust in the English translations, typically it is exactly the same word as faith. So when you see believed, what it's saying is faith. God saved you by his grace when you had faith, when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. There's no merit in it You're, because it's a gift of God, it says. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. Now, that is, a, that is a thing that is believed in a lot of churches today. You go to heaven according to how good you've been. I'm real glad that's not true because this pastor would be in a whole lot of trouble. Faith, it says, is not credit from you. It's not something you can earn. It's not something you can do. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. I can't go, well, I know I'm going to heaven. Are you going to heaven? Look how good I am. No, because we can't boast about any of these things. It is strictly a gift from God. But, listen to this, that is with regard to your salvation justification. In this world, we, we are experiencing salvation by sanctification. Now that just means that as we live in a fallen world, in fallen bodies, we have an opportunity to grow closer and closer to God. Paul seems to indicate to us in, in Ephesians and other places that he's writing that we can grow our faith, our faith can grow, so that as we live in this world, we can experience the true relationship we already legally have with God. Our, our legal justification is God sees us as if we'd never sinned. We are justified just as if we'd never sinned. But as an experience, we can have that experience or relationship with God as we go through this world, as our faith grows. Now here's Here's how I've found that worked in my life. This isn't a testimony of a model for anybody else's life because I found that it's different in everybody's life. 
But here's, here's just the model from my life. So this is an anecdotal testimony. I found that as I began to believe and trust, there's that word trust, faith again, trust in God, that as I trusted in him initially with small stuff, now that shows a lack of my faith, but initially with small stuff that I, I said, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with this over here. Don't know how it's going to turn out, but even if it doesn't go like I think it should, the ramifications aren't going to be huge because it's a little thing. It's not a big thing. And so I trusted him with the little stuff over here, and then I went, wow, that's cool. That, that's really neat. And then I, I, just, I determined I was going to trust him with little bigger things and then little bigger things until you go, I'm sold out. God, God says he will prove himself to be who he is, who the nature and character of God says he is. Now, my hope, my dream for all of you is that you don't have to do that. That you can just be like a few people that I've known that have gotten saved and just, man, they got it. They just, they just went for it. They put it all on the line, and they saw God work miracles in their life. My prayer for, for this congregation is that's who you will be. But my experience, my personal experience, I just have to testify and be honest with you to say that's not been my personal experience because I didn't have that kind of faith initially. However you do it, do it. Just do it. And give God some opportunity to show who he is in your life. Okay, let's look at what faith is. The idea of reconciliation with God comes by faith is not a new idea in Paul's day. Yeah, just don't play with me too much there. Um, the idea of reconciliation. Now, what is reconciliation? Reconciliation is because I'm a sinner, I'm separated from my relationship with God. That, that doesn't mean that, that I haven't asked for salvation and he hasn't given me that assurance of salvation. What it means is that in my experience as I walk in this life, I don't have that closeness with him. It's, it's like any other relationship. Think about it in terms of human relationships you've got. Sometimes those relationships are very, very close. Sometimes there's tensions that have come between those relationships that separate you from that person and that, that build barriers between you and that person. And I've given you some examples in my own life over the last several years that how that's true. And I know it's true in every human being's life. Sometimes you're very close to people, sometimes you're far away. Since God is perfect, it is my relationship with him and my failures that either keep me separated from him or allow me to come closer to him. So it's up to me to adjust. God is not going to adjust his perfection, his holiness, his righteousness toward my imperfection. He says, here's who I am. Here's the bridge to me. Here's the way you can ha have an experience with me. And so my, my distance from God is totally dependent on my submitting. There's that big word, submitting. My submitting to what he says is the best for me and how he's designed me. He says, I designed you this way, and if you will submit to that design, then you can be very close in a relationship with other people and with me. But if you're not submitted to that design, then you're bringing in a contra uh, indication, a contra move to what I'm saying that I've got set up for you that's, that's delightful and joyful and, and has nothing but a good life in store for you. So by faith, that is my put trust in God, it's not a new idea for Paul. He talks about it in Colossians, Galatians, and other places. And also, long before Paul's time, in the Old Testament. Because here's, here's one of the questions that comes up occasionally. If my faith is through Christ, that is, the Son bringing that bridge for me on the cross, what about all those people before the cross? What about all those people before Christ came into the world? What about Abraham? What about King David? What about all these people that apparently had a good relationship with God? At least, hey, they were sinners, but they, they found reconciliation with God. What about all those people? And how does that work? Well, we're going to try to answer that this morning, too, because it's important for us to see the answer to that for this one reason. 
we need to understand that God never, ever changes. He hasn't changed in how he accepts people and walks with people. He has is, he is not changed any of that. It, it was always by faith. It was always by belief. It was always by trust in God. And then he said, I'm going to bring in uh, the answer to the question, how is that so, when Jesus comes into the world? In other words, faith in the Old Testament was faith in God looking forward to the answer that would bring total reconciliation. Our faith on this side of the cross is in God looking back and trusting in the reconciliation that's already been made. Okay, so that's how, that's how that works, but God was the same in the Old Testament. We had reconciliation, we had trust and faith, talked about all the way through the Old Testament as well. So let's start in Romans chapter 4, in verse number 1, and we'll, uh, we'll make our way through a, a healthy portion of this chapter today. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter of faith? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by his works, in other words, he's not justified by his faith, if he, in fact, is justified by his works, as some Jews believed at the time, he had something to boast about, but not before God. Now, here's, here's the reality. Sometimes our good works will be a boast to our culture, a boast in our society, a boast in our families. They will give us credit for stuff that, we, that they go, well, look how good so-and-so did. They, they did this, and they'll boast about you. But he says, not before God. That doesn't give you any credit before God. It is in faith that you have credit before God, and that's a gift of God. So you receive a gift. Comes up Christmas morning, and Ruthie gives me a big, pretty box, a, a big, nice gift, and, and I bring it up here, and I set it in the chair, and I just look at it and say, what a pretty package that is. What, how, do, how good of Ruthie to give me a gift at Christmas. But if I never open the gift, if I never receive what she has given, I never reap the benefits of that. It's a gift. All I have to do is receive it. There's nothing meritorious about receiving a gift. But I've got to receive it. And God is saying, I've got a free gift for you. All you have to do is receive it. Just, just receive what I'm giving. Because you can't do it by works. Even Abraham in the Old Testament couldn't do that. Verse 3. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed. There's that word faith again, believed. Abraham believed. Abraham had faith in God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Faith in what God says he has done for you, belief, trust that what he has said he has done for you is true. My trust in that gives credit before God in saying, I gave you the gift, you received it. When I look down at the... At the uh, the, the covenants, the, the law, when I look down through the Ark of the Covenant, I'm looking through the blood of Jesus Christ, and you are justified by your faith. It's not going to be by tradition. It's not going to be by ritual. It's not going to be by all the things. All the things given in the Old Testament that pointed toward Christ, Christ has fulfilled. And now your trust, your faith, your belief, all those are the same word, which means that my trust in him is equivalent to, to faith. My belief in him is equivalent to trust. So all those words being the same. Abraham believed, he trusted God, and it was credited to him as, as righteousness. When God looked at Abraham, even though Abraham all but sold out his wife into an adulterous situation, because he, but twice, because he had fear, so he's going to take it upon himself to protect himself by selling out his wife. He said he had faith in God, and God forgave him even that. He had faith, he, had belie he believed in, he trusted in God, and God saw it as righteousness. It says, it uses the word here, credited. That's like you go to the bank and you, you ask the bank teller, so I need to write some checks today, what's my balance? 
And the bank teller looks in your account and says, $10,748,000. And you go, but I never put any of that there. Well, somebody did. It's here. Well, you, you go, no, I think I had about $3.27. <laughs> and they, she says, no, I'm sure it's here. She goes back, looks at the cameras. Somebody had come in the day before, and it was one of your best friends, and they just deposited that money into your account. You didn't earn that money. You didn't merit that money. You had no, you had no legal right to that money until somebody credited it to your account. You didn't, you didn't earn it. Somebody gave it to you. It was a gift. It was a gift to you. So they believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. It goes all the way back to Genesis 15 with regard to Abraham. He's talking about all the way back at the very first part of the Bible. It's called imputed righteousness. In other words, it's, it's not earned. It's just imputed to your account. It's the same as in Romans 3.21, which we've already looked at. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law apart from the law, has been made known to you. That's what this is all about. Verse 22, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. I, I can't earn it, but it's available to everyone. But pastor, I, you don't know my dark heart. I get, I, listen to me. I get glimpses of it every time I look at my own. You don't know what I've done. Well, y'all don't know what I have done. It is by faith, thank God, that I can receive this free gift of salvation, that I am righteous before God. It is imputed, it is invested into me as righteousness. Abraham received acceptance exactly the same way we do, by faith apart from works. Now, what does that mean? That means this. I cannot say enough Hail Marys. I cannot confess enough sin to priests who don't, who, who, who don't have to be there to receive my, my confession anymore because why? The veil's been rent. I go straight to the source. When I pray, I'm praying directly to God. Amen. And it's a blessing that he has rent the veil. I don't need any of those things. I don't need, I, I, you know, there, there's so many people that have started off with, with the word of God and run tangents with it. Tangents way away from the word of God. I, I go do missions. And by the way, we Veritas has been invited to come back to Africa. They're not going to have their meetings this year. It's going to be in 2022. But we've been invited to come back and establish their, their apologetics curriculum for the entire group, 300 pastors there. And so we're, that, we're planning toward that. But I don't go do that to earn my way to salvation. I go do that because God has implanted his love in my heart, changed my life, and I love him and I want to serve him. And so I go do that because I love him, not in order for credit. In other words, I can't knock on enough doors and make testimonies to earn brownie points. I, I don't earn any brownie points. There are no brownie points. There's no gold, gold stars. Even though we've got gold stars in the Sunday school rooms, we don't have gold stars in heaven. And I'm thankful for that too, because I can't earn enough gold stars to be there. Verse 4. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. So you're employed, your employer comes to you, and he says, I got this gift for you. It's Christmas. Here's your Christmas bonus. Gives you an envelope. You eagerly rip into the envelope. You pull it out, and it's your paycheck. And you look at the paycheck, and you say, no, that's not a gift. I earned that. That's not a gift. I made that money. You're just giving me something I already earned and you're calling it a gift. This is saying, but it's, it's not by obligation that this gift is given. It's not credited to you as a gift if, you don't, if, it, if you've earned it. And God is saying, this is a gift. The word there is charis, a charis. The, the, the idea of, of an unmerited favor. I can't merit it. I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. 
It's just given. That's what Kari says. It's grace. God's grace says, I'm going to cover you. It is by that grace that we're saved, through faith. And that not of your works, but it, lest any man should boast. Verse 5, however, to the man who does not work, watch this, but trusts, there's that word again, trust, faith, has faith in God, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So let's look at it again. We've already answered the question, but what is faith? If that's true, what is faith? Here's, here's how simple this is. Trust in God. Just trust him. When he says A, B, and C, you don't go D, E, and F. He says A, B, and C, you go, okay, that's A, B, and C. I'm going to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accept that. And what's he done? He said, I provided atonement for you, so... Accept that. Now, here, here's, here's my personal problem. I always want to try to fix it. I always want to try to do it myself. I want to go, but, but God, I didn't earn any of this. Right. Exactly. You didn't earn any of it. His grace gave it to you. But now, as we live in this life, we have an opportunity to trust in him daily and that trust brings us closer to him. And when I trust him more, it brings me closer to him. And when I trust him more, I'm, I'm, I'm walking with him. And so he gives us the opportunity at our justification, that is the day that we're saved, we become justified before the Father. He gives us the opportunity to say yea or nay, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to receive that gift. But every day he gives us the opportunity to walk close to him or not walk close to him. God hasn't changed in the fact that he loves you. He wants you to love him freely, and he's given you that opportunity to choose every day to walk close or not to walk close. By faith, I walk close. By faith, I trust. By faith, I believe that he actually is who he says he is. Those are real things. By trust. Either faith or works, but not both. It means this. Faith plus works equals works. This is not the new math. This is the old math. Faith plus works just equals works. You'll never get to heaven that way. You'll never have a relationship with God that way. You'll never be able to walk close to him that way. Because as long as you think you're earning something, you're not trusting in him. So God... I trust you with this thing, whatever this thing is, my bank account, my, my car, my family, my church, uh, my business, whatever it is, whatever that thing is, I trust you with that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, this part of it over here, I'm just not going to trust you with because I, you know, you know I got to get in there and do that part. Now, sometimes God, in fact, many times God will say, Okay, I've given you the ability to fill that role. Go fill it. So I'm not going to step in and do it for you, but I'm, I've given you that opportunity. Go fill that. But then you've got to trust God with the outcome of that. If he said do it this way, and we did it this way, we didn't cheat, we didn't steal, we didn't rob, we did it right. If we did it right, and it looks like do, doing it right is exactly the wrong thing in this world because if we do it right, I'm not going to get this benefit or that benefit or this something over here. If I just do it a little bit wrong, if I sin just a little, then everything's going to be cool. No, it's not. Why? It might work out in this world, but your relationship with God has been breached. So that faith plus works equal works, and faith is not works. Verse 6, David, King David, also spoke of this when he said and described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Now, who is David? This, is, this comes from a psalm right after, listen to this, this comes from a psalm right after King David had had an adulterous affair with a married woman and then had her husband murdered. And then David says, 
that he finds happiness understanding the declared righteousness without working for it, that his works were evil. But here's the key for David. David understood repentance. And when David stepped up before God and and said, I repent, he meant it. And he would turn and go the other way. That was his walking in this world. It wasn't that David never sinned. It wasn't that Abraham never sinned. Far from it. These guys are major sinners. But they have close, they're described in Hebrews as being champions of the faith. Why? Because they understood what it was to repent, to trust in God and say, I walk away from those things that I know I'm breaching with you. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight, that is, out of the sight of God. Why? Because he's looking through the blood of Christ. It's not that God forgot that you sinned. It's that he's looking through through the blood of Christ and all those things that judge you. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. He has imputed righteousness to you. He has canceled your debt, and he has credited your righteousness. That's good banking right there. That is, that is great banking. I wish they'd do that to my bank account. That'd be, that'd be nice. Verse 9, now, is this blessing only for the Jews? Or is it also for uncircumcised Gentiles? Circumcision was viewed both by the Jews and the Gentile world at this point in time, and right now today as well, as works. You had to have faith in God, but you also, by the Jews, had to be circumcised if you were a male. You had to have that done because it was was a tradition, it was a ritual done within the culture of the community that said you must do this in order to be right with God. So it was faith plus circumcision plus the works of circumcision. We go, I remember one of the first times we went to Africa, and we were driving along, and we had several African guys with us, and, and the mission team, we saw this, this hill, this hillside, grassy hillside, and on the hillside were all these guys sitting out there with red blankets over their, their shoulders. 18, 19, 20 years old, sitting out there probably 20, 25, sitting on this hillside. I said, what's, what's going on there? I thought they were having a meeting of some kind. And he says, they're healing from their circumcision. I, I've got in my office a circumcision knife that's from that tribe, the Zulus. It's about that long. It's got a great big wide curved blade on it. It looks like a, a machete, but it's only about that long. Sharpened with rocks. About a third of these guys every year that they're circumcised between 18 and 20 years old die of infection. But they're meeting the traditions of their culture. They're meeting the traditions they think keep them right with God. And God, and God says, it's not about any kind of works. It's all about your faith. Look at David. Look at Abraham. Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised that he was credited with his righteousness or before? Well, the fact was it was before. Before he was circumcised, he was credited as righteous. Look at Genesis 17, 1. It's 25 years earlier that he is, he is credited with righteousness before he is circumcised. So faith doesn't equal ritual. Faith is not works. Faith is not ritual. Verse 11, circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. In other words, Gentiles, all you Gentiles in the room, this is good news. They are counted as righteous before their faith, because of their faith, because of their faith. 
Verse 12, and Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised, but only if they have the same kind of faith, trust, belief Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, uh, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. Not the law, but by faith. So faith is not the law. Faith is not equal to the law. So biblical faith is not works, it's not ritual, it's not law. Also, let me add to that, it's not mental sin. It's not just going, yeah, I believe, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, I believe that. If that's all it takes, I'm good. No, because James 2.19 says even Satan believes that. Mental assent is belief that faith is trust in. Got it? It's not belief that, but trust in. Putting my trust in somebody. It's like the stool. Okay, there's, there's a stool. And I, somebody bring me a stool from back there. So there's a stool, and you go, okay, I see that stool. I, I believe in that stool. I believe, I believe it's really there. I, I don't believe this is an illusion. I believe it's really there. I believe that, that stool exists. I believe, I believe that stool will hold my weight. I believe it will. I look at it, it looks solid, it feels pretty solid, I believe it. But until I do this, I haven't trusted that it will hold my weight. I haven't trusted it. I, I, I haven't believed in it biblically until I put my weight on it. There, were, there was a translator in one of the tribes uh, in South America that... Um, was doing a translation of the Bible, and he was trying to translate what tr trust is, what faith is, and there was no word in the language for, for that. And there was a, one of the native guys ran in, and he threw his body into a hammock and just went, oh. And he asked the, one of the guys with him, he says, what's, what's the word for that? What's the word for when he threw his body into the hammock? What is that? And he told him, and that's the word he used for faith. It's trusting in. Mental ascent, it's not. I believe in my wife back there. <laughs> Five foot three, apparently has a, a literal material body, but I'm not saying I believe that she exists. I, I've lived with her 46 years now. I'm not saying that I believe she exists. I'm pretty sure she exists. But if I say I believe in my wife, what I'm saying is I trust her. I trust her with our finances, I trust her with my life. When she puts a meal in front of, front of me, I don't question whether there's poison in it or not. I trust her with that. That's different. That's not just believing that, it's believing in. Uh, it, it also, biblical faith is not a feeling. And this is a mistake in the church today because the church today believe that, that many churches today believe that if they can just work you guys up, if we can just get, if we can hire that perfect praise man, if we, can, if we can move you with some kind of a, uh, inspirational story or song or get you worked up, get you sweating, that, that then you'll develop this feeling that will be faith. And here's what I, what I found, because I, I was a part of one of those groups one time that that's what they did. I would go on Sunday and I would get all juiced up and I'd walk out and on Monday my balloon was deflated because the feeling was gone. It was over. It was gone. It was, it was left at that moment in time in the church. Faith is not a feeling. Now faith, faith can lead to a feeling, but it's not a feeling. Faith leads to dependable feelings. Faith Faith that is true, trust that is true, allows God to work in my life to where I go, okay, I, I, well, he did that. I mean, that's incredible. Chris and I were talking yesterday about all the things God's doing in his life. And I'm going, <laughs> yeah. And now his faith is going to grow a little more. He's gonna, as he walks with the Lord, he's going to grow closer as he gets. All of those things are true. And that leads to a feeling of trust 
that can be depended on. That is good, but you can't let feelings lead. You know, if feelings lead, you end up in bad places. Feelings lead to an undependable faith, and you, we don't, any of us want that. So, it's also not positive thinking or pos- positive wishful thinking. I have a lot of people, particularly in this community, and this, they'll just tell me, you know, I came to your church, and I just got good vibes. Well, you know, I, I'm glad you got good vibes, but what I want to know is did you grow closer to the Lord in that? Or is that just a deflated balloon on Monday morning? That's what I want to know. We're going to be talking about how to teach in here on Wednesday afternoon for Veritas. And here's one of the things that I'm going to say to these guys. When you're teaching God's Word, unless lives are actually changed, you haven't taught. Until, until they're actually moved to change, you haven't taught anything. You, you, you may have expressed truth, but until that connection that's made and that person has trusted God, you've not taught a thing. I learned that from a professor I had, Dr. Tom Howe. He, he, at the end of all of his classes, he would hand out a questionnaire. So how was the class? Have you seen, and the last question always was, he would ask specific questions, the last question always was, have you changed as a result of this class? And if so, how? And if you had not changed, he considered himself a failure. He didn't teach. That's, that's what it is to teach. If Christ has been raised, your faith is worthless you are still in your sins. If he's not been raised, your faith is worthless and you're still in your sins. It's got to be based in truth. The, the, The resurrection must be true for all of this to be right. It can't just be this ephemeral thing we go, oh yeah, I'm going to believe in the thing that's not obviously true. It has to be true. It's not mind over matter. It's not mind power. It's not an arbitrary choice that we make. None of those things. Believing what is false is not faith. Alpha Centauri. There's a star, they say the closest star to us, Alpha Centauri. I don't know anything about astronomy or any of this stuff, but, but what I've read about Alpha Centauri, I've read about it, my little bit of knowledge in the area that I look at it and I go, that's cool, I believe in Alpha Centauri. I believe it's actually there, I believe it actually exists, but I hadn't put my faith in that. You understand the difference? It's not that kind of a thing. Uh, Alpha Centauri is what I'd call a low-impact belief. In other words, it makes very little difference in my everyday life whether I believe in Alpha Centauri or not. But it makes a great deal of difference in my life if I've trusted in Jesus. It's not a low-impact belief. It's a high-impact belief. So not all belief is the same. Abraham's original calling, Hebrews 11.8, by faith, Abraham, when called to a a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. That's that's trust. There's faith. God said go. He said, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how long it'll take to get there. I don't know the way. God said go. He said, okay, I'm gone. Obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. That is based on truth. He trusted God when God told him because God told him. If you or I had told him, he probably wouldn't have paid any attention. But God told him to go and he went. He acted on on the belief. That's faith. Biblical faith is a willingness to act based on God's truth. Romans 4.18 In hope against hope, Abraham believed. In other words, Abraham had every reason not to believe. He was old, he was comfortable, he was on on mission there, he had his wife there, he he had his herds there, his family there, the people that served him, his family, his, his servanthood people there. He had all those people to serve him, and God said, pick up all of that and leave. Go. And Abraham goes, he believes. So became the, the father of many nations. He did what God told him to do. And even though he's 100 years old plus, 
just as he had said to him, so shall your offspring be. Against based, again, based on truth of God's word. Verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. 100 plus, Abraham's body is as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah, his wife's womb, was also dead. Sarah had never had any children. Now she's very old, and, she, and, and expect her to, I mean, technically, Abraham maybe could still father, but Sarah going to give birth? Says her womb's dead. In other words, her womb is dried up. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened, listen, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Okay, I don't get it, God, but you said it, and you told me that you promised me this, so I'm going to trust you in it. His faith, it says, was strengthened when he gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. God, you spoke and this world came into existence. You can take this dead body and create a child. You can take these two dead bodies and create a child. He depended on God to perform, and he was persuaded, fully persuaded. How did that happen? He trusted God, trusted God, trusted God, and God showed him. So biblical faith is willingness to act based on God's truth, not on, on the reason of man that his body was too old in this case, with complete dependence upon him to perform it for you. Applying the model to Niagara Falls. I told you the story before of the guy who puts up the tight wires going across Niagara Falls, pushing a wheelbarrow. He gets to the other side, people are cheering and applauding, getting, getting all kinds of excited about him going across with a wheelbarrow. How many of you believe I can pile 150 pounds of gravel in here and go across, back across with 150 pounds of gravel in here and the crowd goes wild, yes, yes, go, go for it, do it. And so he does it, he gets to the other side and all the people are raising their hands and getting excited and over there and he says, how many of you believe I can dump this gravel out and put a 150 pound person in here and go back across? And he's, he's, the old crowd goes wild, he says, yes, yes, yes. He says, you, ma'am, you who's screaming yes, you believe, come get in. Now we're going to see if you really have faith, right? That's what Abraham did. He said he put his dependence on it. It's a personal rescue. He threw his weight onto the thing. It's, we, we have spiritual growth that can come out of this whenever we trust in him like this. A genuine trust in Christ to do what he said he's going to do. So what do we do? We say, God, your word says this. That seems to be contradictory to this. God, I confess I want to believe this over here, but because your word says this, I'm going to trust it. I'm going to go for that. And maybe you start like me, you start with some small stuff and you go, God, just help, help me grow my faith. Maybe, maybe you're so far beyond me, you just go, well, I'm going to go for the whole thing. I'm going to, when he tells me this, I'm going to go for the big stuff, and that's, that's, that's awesome too if that's where you are. I want you to come this morning with your tithes and offerings, those gifts that you would give to God uh, as he has instructed and as he has laid upon your heart. Uh, by all means, don't come if he hasn't impressed that upon your heart. If you're here as a guest this morning and you don't feel inclined to do that, don't feel obligated to do that. It's not, it's not our calling to call on you to give unless God moves on your heart to do so. But we're going to take this time for tithes and offerings. We ask Elva to come.